In this lecture, we are going to start the discussion of solving inverse problems. We are doing this for the first time in this lecture series. So, to get started, I am going to consider the simplest version namely static deterministic linear inverse problem. We also have attached a qualifier called well posed problem. We will describe what a well posed problem is as we develop the details of the statement of the problem. I would like to start by describing an example this is called a straight line problem. Suppose a particle is moving in a straight line the particle with the moving at the velocity v it started in initial position z naught. We do not know where it started we do not know z naught we do not know what the velocity of the motion is. We can only observe the position z i of the particle at time t i. Let us assume we are going to measure the position the of the particle at times t 1 t 2 t 3 t m where t 1 is less than t 2 less than t 3 less than t i less than t m. In this case the t here must be a lower case t a lower case t t m. So, let the particle pass through the position z 1 at time t 1 let the particle pass through the position t 2 at time at time t uh, 2 z i at time t i and z m at time t m. So, what is the st statement? The statement is the following we have a set of observations of the time and position the pair t i z i for i is equal to 1 t m. In other words, we have m pairs of time versus position. This is the position at which the particle appears uh, at, 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 at uh, uh, the z i is the position at which the particle appears at time t i. So, knowing t i z i for i running from 1 to n our aim is to estimate the unknown z naught and v. So, this is the data that is what we need to find. So, you can conjure up the product is like this it is moving in a straight line it started at the position z naught it is traveling at the velocity v at this is z 1 this is z 2 this is z i this is z m this position is t 1 t 2 t i t m. We can only observe the position of the particle at various times we do not know the velocity we do not know the position is started we would like to be able to estimate the velocity and the position knowing a bunch of m observations that is the problem. Why this is called an inverse problem let us talk about it in a moment. In order to be able to uh, uh, formulate the inverse problem I need a mathematical model the mathematical model is one that relates the known to the unknowns in this case the unknowns are z naught and v the knowns are z i and t i. The model is now based on simple basic physics from basic physics we know that if a particle started at position z naught and traveling with a constant velocity v the position z i that it would be at time t i is given by this simple relation from basic fundamental physics. So, this relation relates the unknown z naught and v to the known z i and t i. So, I have n I have m values I have m equations like this. So, this I can rewrite the vector matrix notation. So, z 1 is equal to uh, uh, z 1 z 2 z i z m r f is a vector z is the vector of all positions at m different times z naught and v are the unknowns. <coughs> the, 
by using matrix vector multiply you can see if I multiply the first row by this column I get z naught plus v t 1 z naught plus v t 2 z naught plus v t i z naught plus v t m each one of them corresponds to the position at various times. So, I call the vector z 1 to z m as z I call this matrix with the first column 1 second column t 1 t 2 t m as h I, I call the vector z naught and v as x. So, x the components of x there are two components first component is z naught second component is v the unknown is a vector of size 2 the known is a vector of size m h is a matrix h is a m by 2 matrix it has m rows and 2 columns. So, this problem can be stated as z is equal to h of x z is equal to h of x. So, z is equal to h of x is the mathematical relation that simultaneously captures all the positions that are observed at m different times. So, z is a m vector h is a matrix which is m by 2 x is a vector which is r 2. Now, please go back our to our definition of direct problem and inverse problem given a given b uh, uh, um, uh, I am sorry given a let me it is b given a given x computing b is equal to a x that is the when these two are given computing this that is the forward problem given a given b computing the solution a x is equal to b that is the inverse problem we have already seen that in the in the, in the, in the several uh, uh, classes. Therefore, here this problem z is equal to h of x h is known z is known I need to find x. So, this problem is an inverse problem in the sense of the inverse problem that we have talked about. So, given z and h find given z and h find the x this is an example of a linear problem is an example of an inverse problem is an example of a linear inverse problem the unknown is x the unknown does not vary in time because v is constant the position where the particle started is also a constant. So, it is a static problem the relation z is equal to h is, is, is the model equation this model is a static model therefore, we want to term this as static deterministic linear inverse problem this is the simplest of the problem that one could one could uh, formulate. So, what does it tell you based on a bunch of observations I do a mining I build a data a I, I build a model from the data the mining rule that helps us to build the model is the basic relation in physics Newtonian laws. So, using the Newtonian law I fit a model once I have a model I know what are knowns what are unknowns it turns out this problem as a problem is an inverse problem. So, let us create some nomenclature z belongs to r m r m is a set of all vectors um, of size m. So, that is what is called the observation space in here you can see the observation space r m. So, r m is called the z is called the observation vector r m is called the observation space likewise x is called the unknown vector ok. In the previous case x has 2 components I can generalize that to n components. So, the unknown x is going to have x 1 through x n also r n is a model space h matrix that r m r of m m cross n is the relation between the model space and the observation space. So, if I have x in the in the in the in the model space my h maps the x into z this relation between the model variable and the observation variable is given by the the matrix h. So, h is the known uh, 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 matrix. So, let us come in here. So, z is equal to h of x z is known h is known. So, if I generalize the particle moving in a straight line as an inverse problem the general linear static deterministic inverse problem is to solve given z given h find x such that z is equal to h of x. This is the first statement of the inverse problem based on a very simple problem in physics. 
on methods of solving z is equal to h of x. If m is equal to n and h is non singular from matrix theory we already know h can be written x can be written as sorry, x can be written as uh, h inverse z. But in inverse problems seldom is the case when m is equal to n. In the case of particle moving in a straight line the n was 2 m could be many it could be less than 1 uh, less than 2 it could be equal to 2 it could be greater than 2. So, we need to be able to consider a general case. So, in general h is a rectangular matrix h is a matrix of size m by n m need not be equal to n. So, the standard notion of singularity non singularity singularity and non singularity of the matrix is an attribute of a square matrix there is no concept of singular or non singular rectangular matrices. So, when there is no notion of singular non singular rectangular matrices I cannot even define what the when the solution exists and so on. So, we need to consider a case which is harder than solving linear system A x is equal to b when. So, solving linear system A x is equal to b when A is a n by n matrix b is a n by n vector when A is non singular I simply write x is equal to A inverse b somehow that I cannot do because A in this case is h h is not a square matrix I do not have even the concept of non singularity of a rectangular matrix. So, this problem this linear inverse problem even though it is the simplest problem it's it's it doesn't fit in some of the standard problems that we study in linear algebra. So we need to do develop a theory far beyond what the first course in linear algebra teaches us. In order to examine the solution concept for this, we it is useful to define two cases when m is greater than n, when m is less than n. Please remember, m is the number of observation, n is the number of unknowns. So if m is greater than n, it is called an overdetermined system when m is less than n is called an underdetermined system. We are going to show that in the overdetermined system this the system is inconsistent what does it mean there is no solution for this problem the simple is the system is inconsistent. In the case of underdetermined problem there is no one solution there are infinitely many solutions. But in the case of a x is equal to b when a is non singular that is a single unique solution. So, we are now dealing with a problem that does not have that may not have a solution or that may have either infinite solution. So, these are the two classes of problems that linear inverse problem uh, gives rise to. So, linear inverse problems is more difficult than solving linear systems. So, let us consider a overdetermined case to examine why this cons the, the system is can be inconsistent. So, let us take an example of m is equal to 3 and n is equal to 2. Let us consider a case of h the first column is 1 1 1 second column is 1 2 3 what does it mean t 1 is 1 t 2 is 2 t 2 is 3 uh, 3 t 3 is 3. We can think of the particle moving in a straight line I am observing at time 1 2 and 3. In this case if I look at the column the first column is 1 second column is 1 2 3 there are only two columns these two columns are linearly independent why no one column can be expressed as a multiple of the other. So, in here the columns of h are linearly independent that means if columns of h are linearly independent I can consider the span of h span of the columns of h please recall in the module on finite dimensional vector space we have defined the span to be the set of all linear combinations of vectors here the vectors are columns of h. So, span of h is equal to in this case these two vectors are linearly independent. So, two vectors each of size 3 define a plane. So, this defines a plane which is a subset of R 3. So, R 3 is a three dimensional space the span of the columns of h defines a plane embedded within that three dimensional space. It is in this space we have to do perform certain computations. Now, let us consider I have an observation which is 0, 1, and 2. Since 
this vector z can be expressed as minus 1 times the first column plus 1 times the second column we can see z can be expressed as the linear combinations of the two columns that means z belongs to the span of h. If z belongs to the span of h the solution z is equal to h has a unique solution x is a, 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 a so z naught is equal to minus 1 v is equal to plus 1. So, this is a case where I can solve an overdetermined system, but seldom such a case arise in practice. Recall that the columns of H are defined by the mathematical model, the columns of H comes from the basic physics equation, but Z is a column of observations that come from the real world measurements. The mathematical model describes the real world, but the reality is given by observation. Generally when we say observations, observations also have noise in embedded in them, they are corrupted by noise, observations have noise embedded in them. And so there are two things, observations always have noise and models are always only approximations of reality. So, these are two fundamental facts. Hence more often than not, so this is more often than not, hence more often than not z does not belong to the span of h. If z does not belong to the span of h then there is no solution in the sense that there is a vector x that will satisfy the equation z is equal to h of x. Therefore, in principle when m is greater than n the equations are inconsistent, inconsistent means what? there is no solution that can make the left hand side equal to the right hand side. Let us take another look at the inconsistent case by giving little bit more specific example. I consider the same h, but I consider a vector for observation which is slightly different from the one that we had. Previously I had I am sorry previously I had observation 0 uh, 1 2. Now, I am going to pick an observation 2, 3.5, It could occur in practice. We should allow for this possibility. So, I would like to ask myself the question does there exist an x such that z is equal to h of x? Does there exist an x such that z is equal to h of x? When h is given by this and z is given by this. So, I want to ask myself the question does there exist a h? Let us let us explore this little bit further. So, the first equation tells you x 1 plus x 2 must be 2, second equation tells you x 1 plus 2 x 2 must be 3.5, the third equation tells you x 1 plus 3 x 2 is equal to 4.2. So, if I took the first two equations, so let us consider the first two equations, I have two equations two unknowns, if I solve the two I get the x 1 is equal to 1 half x 2 is equal to 3 by 2, but this solution or the first two does not clearly satisfy the third one. So, yeah, if you talk any subset of two equations and solve them and substitute the third, the third is not satisfied. So, this is true whether you solve 1 and 2, 1 and 3 or 2 and 3. Verify the solution of any two of these three equation does not satisfy the remaining equations that is that is an important thing. So, in this sense there is no solution to z is equal to h of x when m is greater than n. That means, in the case of overdetermined system when I have more, so what, what do you mean by overdetermined system? n is the number of unknowns to be estimated, m is the number of knowns. If the number of knowns m is larger than the number of unknowns n, the system is overdetermined. In this case, the system may not have a solution. So, that is a difficult situation to be in. Now, let us worry about the underdetermined case. Let m is 2. Let m is 2, n is 3. In this case, I am assuming a h is of this form. I would like to be able to solve the equation z is equal to hf. In this case, z1 is given by this, z2 is given by this. Now, what is that I can now do? I can take the first two variables on one hand and kick the third variable to the other side. So, I can rewrite the first equation like this, I can rewrite the second equation like this. The determinant of this system is is is, is not zero uh, is not zero, 
therefore, I can solve these two equations, but if I solve these two equations let us look at the right hand side z1 and z2 are given to us z1 and z2 are given to us x is something to be found. So, I am going to express x1 and x2 in terms of x3 x3 is a free parameter now there are infinitely different values x3 can take. So, for each value we assign to x3 I can find a corresponding x1 and x2 therefore, there is a pair which is x1 of x3 x2 of x3 that means both x1 and x2 are functions of x3 because x3 occurs on the right hand side. There are infinitely many choices for x3 therefore, there are infinitely many solutions. So, in this case there are infinitely many solutions there is no uniqueness. So, in one case there is no solution in another case there are infinitely many solutions. So, we are in between a devil and a deep sea this is the typical nature of the inverse problem inverse problems are generally harder that is why in 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 training in in colleges we generally learn to solve forward problems because forward problems are a lot easier to solve once you learn how to solve forward problems using the knowledge gained in solving the forward problem then we can hope to solve inverse problems efficiently. The summary of the linear inverse problems now z is equal to h of x I'm sorry z is equal to h of x h is a full matrix of full rank. So, please understand when h is m and m the rank of h I want to remind you rank of h is equal to the minimum of m and n. So, when m is greater than n n is the minimum the rank of h is n there is an over determined case is an inconsistent system there is no solution. When this is the summary when m is equal to n the rank of h is n there is a unique solution when m is less than n the rank is m there are infinitely many solution non uniqueness. Generally in a linear algebra course we essentially deal only with this case these two cases are too difficult we solve the over determined problem under determined problem using the method of least squares. So, so what is the least square solution solution least square solution your solution is the left hand side must be equal to the right hand side the least square solution is a solution that may not force the left hand side equal to the right hand side, but in some so if we still call it a solution it is a generalized solution. So, least square solution is a generalization of the concept of solution therefore, least square solution is a very special class of solutions that one has to develop to solve over determined and under determined cases. <coughs> so, now that we have seen the formulation of the problem. So, linear static deterministic uh, linear least square problem have two versions one is the under determined another is the over determined. Now, I am going to move towards developing a strategy to solve the problem. So, what is the method? The method is called unweighted least square solution. I am going to consider the over determined case. Let this the this is the this is R of this uh, I am sorry yeah this is R little r of x it is not lambda r of x define r of x is equal to z minus h of x z is a vector h x is a vector the difference is a vector that vector is a m vector that vector is called the residual vector. If the residual vector is 0 z is equal to h of x, but we have seen we often cannot have the residual vector to be 0 in the case of over determined and under determined. So, when m is greater than n there is no x for which r of x is 0. So, as a compromise what is that we do the value of r of x for a given z and h value of r of x depends on x. So, r of x is the vector when r of x is 0 we get the classical solution. So, what is the generalization of the classical solution for every x r of x is a vector every vector has a length I want to be able to find an x for which the length of this residual vector is a minimum. 
if the length of the residual vector is a minimum means I am trying to force the right hand side to be as close to the right hand side as possible. We cannot make the left hand side and the right hand side exactly equal. We can bring them as close as possible. This notion of being close instead of being equal is the generalization that comes from the concept of least squares. So, as a compromise we seek a vector x belonging to Rn for which the vector R of x will have a minimum length. So, we would like to formulate the problem mathematically so that I can develop an algorithm to that end. I am going to define a function f of x. So, what is f of x? f of x is the square of the norm of the residual vector. Now, you can see the norm of the vector comes into play. The square of the norm of the vector is simply the inner product of r with r, r of x with r of x, r transpose r and that is equal to sum of r i square i is equal to 1 t n. So, which is the sum of the square of the norm of the residual. So, f of x is a function of x that represents the sum of the square of the residuals which is called the r the square of the norm of the residuals. So, what is r r? So, r is a vector it has m components r 1 r 2 r 3 r m r i is the ith component of r r i is equal to z i minus h of i star. So, this is h of i star what does it mean h of i star means h of i star is the ith row of ith row of h h of i star. So, this should be i star i star in the same line. So, which h i same thing in com continuing here is i star is in the same line that is the ith row of h that. So, the, the inner product of the ith row of h and x when subtracted from z i is the ith component of the residual vector. So, f of x is the sum of the square of the components of the residual vector. We want to find a vector x that minimizes f of x that minimizing x is called the least square solution. So, I would like to comment on this a little bit. We have a case where we already know that there is no solution even though there is no solution I would like to be able to look at a generalized concept of a solution. The generalized concept of a solution is that value of x for which the length of the vector residual vector r of x is minimum. So, we have converted the problem of solving a linear least square problem into one of optimization problem. So, that is the that is that is where the optimization comes into play. So, now you can see where the knowledge of finite dimensional vector space, knowledge of uh, norms of vectors, knowledge of minimization and all the things comes into a hue. That is where the importance of module 2 on mathematical primaries becomes fundamental to the persuasion of data simulation problems. So, f of x is equal to r transpose x times r transpose x times r r transpose x times r this r is z minus h of x we already know. So, this is z minus h transpose z minus h we already know the following a plus b transpose is equal to a transpose plus b transpose we also know a b transpose is equal to b transpose a transpose these are the two formulas I am going to utilize. So, I, I first distribute the transpose then I, I use the product rule. So, this product becomes equal to this product now I am go, there are two terms in here there are two terms in here I am going to multiply they are going to be four terms. It turns out each of these terms are scalars now look at this now what is f of x f of x is a function from r n to r. So, f of x is a functional. f of x is a scalar valued function of a vector f of x maps r n to r is a functional. So, each of these this is a scalar this is a scalar this is a scalar this is a scalar the sum of all the scalars this is the quadratic function in x you can you can readily see this is the quadratic function in x. 
this is the linear function in x, this is the linear function in x, this is constant with respect to x. Now, it turns out if you consider this z transpose hx that is a scalar transpose of a scalar is itself therefore, z transpose hx is equal to z transpose hx transpose, but the transpose of the product is the product of the transpose has taken in the reverse order which is this. So, the transpose of the first the second term is the third term transpose of the third term is the second term these two terms are equal. So, I can reduce the four terms to three terms by saying f of x is equal to z transpose f of x is equal to z transpose z 2 z transpose h x plus x transpose h transpose h x. Now, h transpose h that is a Gramian you may remember that a transpose a a a transpose they are Gramian. So, this is the Gramian matrix and this is also a quadratic function in x. So, this is the quadratic function quadratic function in x. So, we have converted the problem of estimating the unknown as one of minimizing a quadratic form in 7. Therefore, I want to be able to estimate the unknown the estimation of unknown is recast as a minimization of a quadratic function. So, you can see the importance of all the things that we have seen in module 2. Now, I would like to be able to explore this um, objective function a little bit further h h trans h transpose h is equal to h transpose h transpose you can really see therefore, h transpose h is symmetric. So, I want to show first show that this matrix is symmetric sorry I would like to that is correct. Therefore, this matrix is symmetric if you look at the previous term the quadratic term is x transpose h transpose h x. So, I am considering x transpose h transpose h f x I can rewrite this in this particular form x transpose h transpose h f x this can be written as h x transpose h f x and that is equal to h x transpose uh, 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 h f x the norm of square. So, when m is greater than n the rank of h is n the rank of h is n the rank of h is n rank of h is n and the columns of h are linearly independent. Therefore, h x is 0 exactly when x is 0 h x is not equal to 0 uh, when x is not equal to 0 these two comes from the linear independence of the columns of h that comes into play. Therefore, this quadratic form is greater than 0 for all x not equal to 0 is 0 only when x is equal to 0 this implies directly h transpose h is not only symmetric it is also positive definite. So, this quadratic function is a positive definite quadratic function. Therefore, what is that we have now we have accomplished number of things I would like to be able to consider this f of x a constant term linear term quadratic term quadratic term is symmetric positive definite quadratic form. If I want to minimize I am going to compute the Hessian and the gradient. So, compute the gradient the there are three terms gradient of the sum is the sum of the gradients. So, the gradient of z transpose z with respect to x is 0 second derivative the Hessian is also 0 gradient of 2 times z transpose h x is equal to 2 a uh, 2 times h transpose z this can be computed I would like everyone to be able to verify this using the formula that we have already derived in the in 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 in, in, in the class on multivariate calculus. The second derivative of this term is 0 the first derivative of the quadratic form is this the second derivative of the quadratic form is also this if you combine all these results term by term I get the gradient of h is equal to this term I get the hessian of h to be this the hessian is already symmetric and positive definite. Therefore, if I equate the first derivative to 0 and solve it that solution must be a minimum because I am I am equating the gradient to 0 and at the at the place where the gradient is 0 the Hessian matrix is also positive semi definite 
it satisfies the necessary and sufficient condition for the minimum. Therefore, I have found the minimum of the objective function which is f of x. So, by equating the gradient to 0 by I get this this so I can transfer the negative term to the other side cancel 2. So, the optimal solution is given by the solution of a linear system h transpose h x is equal to h transpose z. Now, please understand h transpose h is a n by n matrix h transpose z is a n by 1 vector x is also an n by 1 vector. So, we are called upon to solve a symmetric positive definite so this is a symmetric positive definite system such systems in least square methodology is called nonlinear I am sorry normal equations these are the set of normal equations. Therefore, by solving this and this is this matrix is symmetric and positive definite. So, I can solve this by taking the inverse therefore, the least square solution x l s is h transpose h inverse times h transpose z which I write to try to write h plus z where h plus is equal to this and that is called the generalized inverse of h. You remember when we talked about matrices we talked about the general notion of generalized matrices uh, generalized inverse of matrices sorry. So, here we have for the first time in trying to solve a least square problem have come across the notion of a generalized inverse of a matrix. And this minimum is uh, at this point the solution uh, defines the minimum because the hessian is positive definite and f x is a convex function and hence the minimum is unique. The convexity of the function guarantees uniqueness of the minimum positive definiteness of the of, of the hessian tells you the minimum is well defined and the function is convex therefore, it is unique it exists. So, if we have in principle solved the linear least square problem the solution of the linear least square problem is given by equation 13. So, this is the least square solution. So, the definition of the least square solution intrinsically relates to the definition of generalized inverse of matrices. Now, look at that we have talked about two types of generalization one is the generalization of the no notion of the solution itself. The classical notion of the solution is left hand side is equal to the right hand side, but here the generalization is the left hand side is close to the right hand side they are not equal, but close. We have also generalized the notion of inverse of a matrix from inverse of a square matrix to the generalized inverse of a rectangular matrix. So, H is a rectangular matrix H plus is called the generalized inverse of H. When H is a full rank the generalized rank uh, generalized inverse has an exact expression that exact expression is given by equation 14 which is H transpose H inverse H transpose. So, we have introduced lots of newer concepts generalized the old concepts to accommodate the solution for overdetermined problem. And in this process we have demonstrated that all the mathematical tools are used uh, many of the mathematical if not all are used in the derivation of the least square solution and you can see the least square solution is a solution to an optimization problem. Now, if I have so least square solution is not a solution in the classical sense the left hand side is unique, not equal to the right hand side. I said it, is, it has to be close I want to find out how close they are. So, I am going to substitute x l s in terms of x. So, z minus h of l of x is the residual at the minimum the residual at the minimum this residual is a vector and what is the theory guarantees this theory guarantees this is the residual whose length is the minimum. And what is the length of this minimum length vector? I am I am I we can we can we can we can readily compute we can readily compute the norm of this. So, the norm of R of x l s gives you the measure of closeness. So, this is the measure of closeness 
between the left hand side and the right hand side between the left hand side and the right hand side and how do we show the 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 the, the residual is not zero okay now let's look at this now h of h l of uh, uh, x l of x l of x is equal to h transpose h inverse h transpose z so if i substitute this in here and if you simplify you have z minus h h transpose h inverse h transpose z so this is the matrix this is the vector in general this matrix is not equal to identity so long as this big this matrix is not equal to identity this is not zero therefore the 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 least square solution does not guarantee equality between left hand side and right hand side the left hand side is not equal to right hand side but the difference between the left hand side and the right hand side the length of the difference the length of the residual vector is the minimum. So, herein lies the difference between the classical solution where R x is 0 and the least square solution where R x is not 0 for the case of for the over determined case. Hey, this is the best we could do this is the best we could do. Now, if you substitute x l less than f of x we get the minimum value of the sum of the squares. So, that is what is called the minimum value that is a measure of the fit between the model and the observation. So, this is the measure of the fit. The measure of the fit between of the left hand side and the right hand side. An illustration let us go back to the particle moving in a straight line h is all 1 t 1 t 2 t m I can compute h transpose h this is h transpose. So, I have I have h trans I have h transpose I have h I multiply them I get this matrix I, I have h transpose z I multiply this I have this matrix. So, the normal equations are h transpose h x is equal to h transpose z h transpose h is this matrix z naught is uh, z naught v is the matrix um, uh, is the column vector x h transpose z is given by this. Now, dividing both sides by m t bar is the minimum t square bar is the mini is the average of the, um, the t, t bar is the average of t i t square bar is the average of t squares z bar is the average of z's z t bar is the average of the product z i t i. So, by dividing both sides of this equation by m this equation this equation becomes this equation reduces to this equation where t bar t bar square z bar they are all defined in here. This is a 2 by 2 system we can explicitly solve it the the solution for this system is given by this this is an important expression. So, I got an expression I got an estimate for v star what is v star v star is the least square estimate of the unknown velocity what is z star z star is the least square estimate of the initial position. So, if I substituted this in my in my in my in my f of x I get the sum of the square residuals the sum of the square residual is given by this formula and this this formula tells if you replace z z naught by z naught star v by v star it is the minimum value that is possible. Now, we are going to define what is called the Armas error. So, S s e in uh, above is the sum of the square errors sum of the square error divided by m is the average sum of square errors if I take the square root it is a square root of the average of the sum of square errors that is called the RMS error. RMS error gives you a measure of the linear fit. If the RMS error is large the fit is loose if the RMS error is small the fit is tight. The looseness and the tightness of the fit it all depends on the goodness of the data the goodness and the availability of the data. So, a numerical example h is the matrix that is given here h is the matrix that is given here z is the vector that is given here. I compute t bar all the quantities in here 
the 2 by 2 system takes this following form if I solve these two 2 by 2 systems I get V star I get Z star of Z naught star. So, the fitted assimilated model is given by this equation in this case I would like you to verify the sum of square error is 1.5 the square root of the sum of square error is 0.6124. This is the claim I would like you to call you to verify I think it is better to do these calculations and verify the correctness of these things to get a feel for how to do the least square computations. Now, I can I am going to graphically define the solution because it is a simple case 2 by 2. So, I can define what are called contours of f of, f of x what are contours contours are locus of points with a constant value. Now, f of x x is z naught and v. So, f of x has this particular form for the example numerical example that we talked about in this particular case I have actually computed the f of x the 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 quadratic function uh, the quadratic function takes this particular form in this case this is the particular quadratic function. So, what is that we are looking for this quadratic function is like a bowel sitting and and uh, if you took cross sections of that and project them onto the plane they are called contours using MATLAB I have drawn the contours. You can see the the, the minimum lies at the center and if you look at the the if you look at the coordinates of this that happens to be z naught is equal to 0.5 v naught is equal to 0.5. So, this way for a small size problem of un, two unknowns you can actually graphically solve the problem by computing f of x and drawing the contours and looking at the center of that contour. So, this is a graphical method the the, the previous one is the analytical method we can we can solve simple problems by both graphical and analytical methods it is fundamental that we do all these things when we are in the learning process. So, far we talked about weighted least squares now I am uh, uh, I am sorry unweighted least squares. Now, I am going to talk about weighted version I am still going to be concerned with I am still going to be concerned with the over determined case. So, over determined case unweighted least squares is what we saw now over determined case weighted least squares is what we are going to see. So, let b let w be a symmetric positive definite matrix of size m by m. So, instead of so earlier we had considered f of x is equal to z minus h of x transpose z minus h of x in here I am interposing a matrix in between w. So, when w is equal to i the, the weighted becomes unweighted I hope you see the difference between the weight and unweighted. So, in order to emphasize the notion of the weight I am now putting a subscript f of w of x. So, f of w of x is the weighted sum of squares of the residuals in general in the special case w could be a diagonal matrix with different weights along the diagonal or in general it could be a general symmetric positive different matrix. The difference in weight essentially tells you I am going to give different weights to different components of the squares of the residual error that is all what it means. In the unweighted case I am considering all the sum of the residual squares have the same value total democracy that is what the unweighted case is all about. In the case of weighted uh, uh, linearly squares some components have greater weight some components have lesser weight that means I am going to give more important to certain components and less important to certain other components. The question will arise how do I decide which one should be more important which one should be less important that is outside of the scope of this discussion that is something that the designer or the, uh, the person who is interested in solving the problem has to bring to bear those arguments and make sense out of it. But here we are interested in the mathematical setup if you are interested in trying to weight the solutions one uh, 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 notwithstanding how the weights are obtained I am going to tell how to handle the weighted case. So, w could 
in the simplest case w is a diagonal matrix with all 1 which is identity or diagonal elements with all different elements or it is general symmetric positive different matrix. Again I can multiply the whole sides we can try to minimize this as a function of x this is also a quadratic function of x this quadratic function of x I can compute the hessian the gradient and equate the gradient to 0 the equate the gradient to 0 I get is a new version of the normal equation. You can really just see in the in the unweighted case I simply got h transpose h of x is equal to h transpose z here I have a w factor interposed both on the left hand side and the right hand side. So, you can see these two equations have very similar structure. So, the least square solution so it can be shown h transpose w h is symmetric is also positive definite when h is of full rank. So, in that case I can take the inverse of this. So, x l s is equal to h transpose w h inverse h transpose w z. So, this is the solution for the linear static deterministic weighted least squares. Equation 17 is the analog of the weighted least square compared to the unweighted least squares. So, so far we have talked about the solution of over determined systems. Now, we have to proceed to discussing the under determined case the under determined case we have less observations compared to the unknowns. So far we considered linear least square problems over determined case we talked about the case where it is weighted is unweighted we talked about the generalized inverse we talked about the notion of a least square solution different from that of the ordinary solution we also talked about the notion of generalized inverse all within the context of over determined system. It turns out the theory of over determined system and under determined system are related yet different. Now, I am going to bring out the primary difference between the underdetermined estimation problem and the overdetermined estimation problem that we have already seen. So, consider the underdetermined case m is less than n, m is the number of observation, n is the number of unknowns. Recall in the case of uh, underdetermined problem, there are infinitely many solutions. So, we have headache, headache of one kind in the overdetermined problem, namely, there was no solution here headache is of another kind there is not one solution but there are infinitely many solutions. The challenge is how do we pick one among the many infinitely many solutions that make sense for us. And why we are interested in uniqueness when you want to be able to compute the solution using an algorithm if you want to be able to calculate every calculation must have a target. I want to be able to calculate this quantity that quantity. So, since every algorithm always seeks to find a targeted solution a targeted unique solution we need to be able to build in the notion of uniqueness before we start about with uh, start talking about computing the solution. So, the computational process has to wait until we define what is an appropriate solution what is an appropriate unique solution among infinitely many possible solutions. So, in this case look at this now there are infinitely many solution solution means what Re, uh, the, the residual is 0. So, there are infinitely many x for which r x is 0 if r x is 0 the f of x which is equal to r transpose r is identically 0. If r transpose r is identically 0 there is no x there is no minimization. So, there is no possibility of doing anything similar to what we did in the over determined case for the under determined counterpart. Therefore, we need a new approach we need a new approach to get an unique solution in order to do that we are going to formulate this as an constrained minimization problem 
and this constraint minimization problem is going to be solved by Lagrangian multiplier technique. This constraint minimization problem is going to be an equality constraint minimization problem. So, you can see everything that we have seen in the module on optimization gets to be applied here. So, the pathway to the solution in the underdetermined case is to formulate the problem as a Lagrangian multiplier problem using equality constraint and this equality constraint minimization problem is going to help us to pick that optimal solution among the infinitely many possible solutions that is the pathway. So, what is the problem statement? How do I state the new version of the problem? Find the vector x belonging to r such that its norm is the minimum look at that now. I am not interested in any vector I am interested in picking a solution with the minimum norm, but that x not only must have a minimum norm, but it also must satisfy z is equal to h of x. So, the problem statement is find x such that the, squ the square of the norm is the minimum when it satisfies. So, this must be wh when it satisfies z is equal to h of x. So, yet x must satisfy z is equal to h of x that is the constraint and the norm of x must be minimum. We formulate this as a Lagrangian multiplier problem. So, let lambda be r of m because z is a vector in the m dimensional space h of x is the vector in the m dimensional space. So, let lambda be a m vector define the Lagrangian the Lagrangian x lambda is given by f this is the function to be minimized this is the constraint we are following the same formulation that we described in the module on optimization. So, 18 equation 18 becomes a Lagrangian there are two independent variables x and lambda. So, the above constraint minimization problem is now uh, 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 replaced by an unconstrained Lagrangian minimization problem. This problem is solved by standard techniques. I want to be able to compute the gradient with respect to x and, 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 and minim, minim, minimize with respect to x. I would like to be able to compute the gradient with respect to l and minimize with respect to l. So, these two equations must be simultaneously satisfied to find the optimal x and the optimal lambda. So, there are two unknowns x and lambda the lambda and x that satisfy these two equations are called the optimal x and the optimal lambda. Now, for for the x I am um, sorry for the Lagrangian given in equation 18 if you compute the gradient of x gradient of L with respect to x and lambda there are two equations 2 x is equal to h transpose lambda z minus h x is equal to 0 we have to solve these two equations simultaneously. If I solve these two equations simultaneously I get the solution to be lambda is I, I get the solution to be lambda the optimal lambda is given by this the optimal x is given by this. So, if I substitute this lambda from here to this equation I get the optimum least square solution x l of s to be h transpose h h transpose inverse z. So, when h so this is the unique solution in the case of underdetermined problem when h is a full rank the rank of h is is m it can be verified that h trans h h transpose is symmetric positive definite. So, it is inverse exists therefore, x l s the least square solution can be computed in one of two steps. Um, uh, uh, so, solve h h transpose y is equal to z and find the solution y is equal to h h transpose inverse z and then we can compute x l s h transpose y using this I can I can this implies 23 this implies 23. Therefore, the computation of the least square solution is done in two steps one by solving a linear symmetric system and another using the solution substituting this to get the least square solution. So, we have by invoking to the Lagrangian multiplier technique for equality constraint problem.
we have obtained the solution for the underdetermined case. In this case, I, I have I, I know the formula for XLS from, from equation 23. So, R of the residual at the minimum is Z minus H of L, uh, XLFS. XLFS is given by XLFS is given by this expression. So, if you think of this and multiply by H, you have H H transpose, your H H transpose inverse. So, the one, one is the inverse of the other. So, they get cancelled it becomes okay. So, Z minus Z is 0. So, in this case the residual is 0. So, the optimal solution is one such where the residual is also 0. So, it, that means it, it satisfies the constraint as to be expected as to be expected. Since we start with the infinitely many solution for which Rx is 0 this residual at the minimum must also be 0. So, that is verified. So, with this we come to the end of the discussion of the linear deterministic static inverse problem both underdetermined and overdetermined. We solved the overdetermined problem in inconsistent case where we did not have a solution we tried to bring the right hand side and the left hand side together as close as possible. In the second case there are infinitely many solutions among the infinitely many solutions we have tried to find the one that is of least length the norm of the solution is the least. So, that is how we induce the uniqueness into uniqueness into the least square solutions. With this I would like to encourage you to solve a couple of different problems. The problems are directly related to the development in the in the in the text using I am in, in particular I am going to emphasize that you must do the MATLAB related computer problem by plotting the contours. Once you plot the contours you can read off the minimum by graphical approximation by, by, by approximating um, uh, the, the center of, 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 of the contour. I am also giving exercises with respect to uh, expressions for the generalized inverse finding the, the Hessian the, the gradient of different functions. I am also trying to define properties of the Moore Penrose inverse which we have already discussed when we discussed matrices when we discussed matrices and uh, and uh, the properties of generalized inverse are given by these uh, four equations as the Moore Penrose condition demands. This development is taken from our book Louis Lakshmi Varahan and Dahl published in 2006 dynamic data simulation a least squares approach published by the Cambridge University Press it largely follows the development in chapter 5. Thank you.